My guest today is Professor Stephen Kahn, who's Professor of Particle Physics and Astrophysics at Stanford University. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Physical Society. Welcome. Uh, welcome. Good to be here. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So, so we're going to talk about the LSST, um, I guess, which is appropriately renamed into the Vera Rubin Observatory uh, recently. Um, so if you say that you have a review paper here from science drivers to reference design and anticipated data products. You say major advances in our understanding of the universe frequently arise from dramatic improvements in our ability to accurately measure astronomical quantities. Aided by rapid progress in information technology, current sky surveys are changing the way we view and study the universe. Uh, so LSST, um, I obviously don't have a background in um, astrophysics, let alone, let alone physics, Steve. So as I was sort of skimming through the paper, the, the one thing that jumped out at me is sort of the broad objectives of this mission. Typically, you see very, very narrow, we're going to go look this part of the sky in this distance, and we're going to find this thing. Here I see dark energy and dark matter, which is a question, of, a question for the universe. I think inventory of the solar system, which is much more, much closer, a mapping of the Milky Way, sort of intermediate and transient optical sky exploration. And so is this really truly different from most of the other sort of missions we have run that is very, very focused? Yeah, so let me address that question. So, um, you know, throughout human history, of course, we've built telescopes starting with Galileo and on into the biggest telescopes that exist today. And for the most part, those uh, telescopes were designed to uh, focus on relatively small parts of the sky and to study them with increasing detail. So, you know, initially it was just a question of taking pictures and seeing what's out there. And then, um, you know, in the, in the 20th century, mostly we developed techniques in spectroscopy to measure the spectrum as a function of color or wavelength of different objects, which gives us information about physical conditions. So most of, most of modern astronomy and astrophysics has been finding various kinds of objects and then studying them in more detail. Um, but while that is great for you know, building up a lot of what we know about the contents of the universe, um, there are quantitative questions with, you know, just how many objects we've actually looked at. And this affects um, various things. First off, um, if, you, if you're looking at objects one by one or in small things, then you don't build up very large statistical samples. So, you know, it's a question of like uh, studying houses by looking at your neighbor's house or maybe a few houses on your block versus having a sample of all the houses in the United States, yeah. which clearly provide different kinds of information. So one of the drives is to dramatically increase the sample of everything we know about the universe. Uh, and I'll come to how that, that comes down. Another drive, which is one of the main uh, areas of emphasis for the Rubin Observatory, is adding the time dimension so not only studying objects at a particular time, but studying them, their behavior over time. So we take many, many images of every part of the sky, and then we can see how objects intrinsically vary uh, with time in the sky. And then uh, because this is a very large telescope with a very advanced system, um, we can see to very faint levels. And that allows us to go further out in the universe, uh, which does two things. Number one, it's a much larger volume of space that's sampled. So again, many more objects. But also, of course, as you go further out in space, you're also going further back in time. And so we get to earlier phases of the universe and we get to investigations that involve, um, you know, how the universe is evolving. So, the different science themes that, that you mentioned, and I'll come to them later individually, um, they all benefit by having many observations of an extremely large part of the sky, and that's what's really new. Okay, okay. Yeah, so that makes a lot of, a lot of sense. So this is sort of, um, 
exploration from almost like a statistical perspective that if we can get more and more data points, we will have a better sort of a overall cross-sectional understanding of what is out there. Um, and, and so that's, that's the, is that the way to think about the Rubin Observatory, that you're collecting a lot more data than that, that would be typically looked at? Yes, I think that's that's a good way of thinking about it. There are other ways to think about it, but this is what I emphasize myself, that the Rubin Observatory, for, for every kind of astronomical system we know about in the sky, the Rubin Observatory will increase the sample by factors of 100 to 1,000. So if you think about rare classes of stars or with special characteristics, maybe we currently know of 20 such objects in the universe, after Rubin will know of thousands to twin, tens of thousands. Now, you know, the power of statistics, that's not just about collecting more data and saying, gee, I got more of these. Um, a good analogy is, you know, the current progress over the last year in understanding the COVID vaccines. Uh, as you know, the biggest limitation was not the quality of the vaccine, but just how many individuals were tested and how many diverse cases could we see before we could conclusively demonstrate that we understood the power of the vaccine in combating the disease in various different ways. And the analogy is good there because the principal problem with, say, human health studies is that people are different. And, you know, it's, they're not all identical. And so if you see the same thing in three people, you know it works because people have all sorts of other kinds of differences associated with them, their age, their background, where they live, you know, what they've done over the course of their life, et cetera. And so in order to evaluate what's happening in a situation like that, you need to average over all those other dimensions. And the only way to do that with vaccine studies is to get a very large sample of patients and to use controlled studies. So similarly, if you're trying to study objects in the universe, you want to get enough, you know, stars are also, and galaxies, they also differ from one another. They're not all identical. And uh, part of their differences have to do with things like their mass, their age, how rapidly they're spinning. In the cases of galaxies, exactly how they formed, when they formed, uh, what their constituents are. And so if you're trying to find general patterns you need to average over all those quantities in order to isolate what you're actually looking for. And that requires very large statistical samples. And that's what's really new about Rubin that, that will give us. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I always wondered about this, Steve, that, you know, we sometimes have this, what they call the crisis in cosmology. So the, the latest thing was Hubble constant, right? This right. seems like it's settling down now, but, uh, but, I always felt that the observations that we have to make this grand statements are so limited. How do we know, uh, you know, if we're anywhere close to the actual, uh, the actual number, right? I mean, we have to really broaden the observations to really get some feel for that. Right. So there, there was a, a real revolution in cosmology that occurred at the end of, of the 1990s and the beginning of 2000s. And um, it's, it was really a, a paradigm-breaking revolution. Um, you may have had other guests in this program that have talked about it before, but I have my own perspective on it because prior to that period, I actually did not work in cosmology. And after this revolution, I decided this is the field I'm going to change over to. And um, I, I kind of was one of the keys of people who started the Rubin Observatory in response to that desire. So let me, let me try to give you a little bit of an understanding of what the issue is. So prior to this discovery in 1990, cosmology was really more religion than, than scientific measurement. There were, it started with a lot of uh, beliefs about what the universe should look like, um, the fact that it should be homogeneous, it should be isotropic, it should be various things. And then you could work out using principally general relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity, to, you know, what are the possible universe descriptions you can make with those assumptions? That's largely what the field was. But the, the, those models were not very well anchored by observations. And the observations that we did have were pretty much 
conflicting with one another. And so, you know, there, there wasn't a lot that made sense. For example, the thing I liked most from that period, and this is as recently as the mid-1990s, the age of the universe, the universe appeared to be younger than the oldest stars. So we knew about stars in the galaxy, which we could uh, date their age based on uh, various aspects of their composition or our understanding of how stars evolve, et cetera. And the date we had for the beginning of the universe was actually younger than these stars. So when you have an, a, a theoretical model that has that big a problem with it, <laughs> then it's clear there's something wrong. And, um, you know, the attitude at the time, and I remember this well, was, well, you know, we don't have very precise measurements, so let's not worry about those details and continue on. So what happened in 1990, uh, in the late 1990s, 1998, uh, be, to be precise, was a measurement was made um, using supernovae, uh, a particular kind of supernovae, which were exploding stars, that suggested that the universe was the expansion of the universe, which had been known for many, many years, was actually accelerating rather than decelerating with time. And that was completely contrary to common sense. You know, it, and the reason is, if you think about it, gravity as we know it is an attractive force and everything's pulling on everything else. So as the universe is expanding, um, the gravitational forces of all the constituents of the universe are pulling on one another. So that's expected to retard that expansion. expansion. And therefore, the universe should have been slowing down, not speeding up. And in fact, we saw the opposite. So it's kind of like if you threw a ball up in the air, you know, under the influence of the Earth's gravity, and rather than it have it fall back or slow down and eventually fall back down, it actually sped up and went further away. So it looked like the, the observation looked like a kind of anti-gravity force. And um, I'll come back to the way we think about that. Um, but the, the major issue at the time was, well, you know, it's not that many supernovae that were discovered. And, uh, you know, maybe there's something wrong with the technique. This, this assumed that these objects were calibratable and they should all be basically the same thing and stuff like that. So there were a lot of assumptions in there. So yeah. most people at the time, and I was included in that group, thought, yeah, this is odd, but, you know, who knows, before we jump to a conclusion that there's new physics. But the really interesting thing is that it, shortly thereafter, a whole bunch of other kinds of observations fell together that confirmed this. Now, number one, the, the, well, number one, what, what could be doing this? And it turns out Einstein's theory of gravity or general relativity allows for the universe to be accelerating if the entire volume of space is filled with a kind of energy field that has negative pressure. And I won't go into the reasons for that, but it, 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 if, if such an energy field exists, then this would explain the data. And, um, there were even theoretical ideas about why such an energy field might exist, but the predictions of what its value should be are, you know, like 100 orders of magnitude off of what it's measured to be. So the, the idea that there might be a pressure, a negative pressure energy field in the universe wasn't entirely new, but the value was very strange. Um, yeah. But once you put that in to the description of cosmology, then it corrects the age problem. The universe turns out to be older than we thought it was. And that's, so that fixes that issue with the oldest stars. It also explained a whole bunch of other discrepant measurements associated with the velocity, observed measure, you know, speeds that galaxies are moving with respect to one another and other things. And then not very long after that, we discovered based on measurements of the cosmic microwave background, the leftover radiation from the Big Bang, that the universe is actually spatially flat. And this was something that makes sense in the context of, you know, if, if the universe is spatially flat, 
than most of the energy in the universe we hadn't seen before. Okay, we, we, could, we could see objects like galaxies and stars and add up how much mass energy is there. And we could even infer the existence of something called dark matter, and infer, but none of that was enough to make the universe spatially flat. And until we threw in this dark energy stuff, and then it somehow all these things came together. So it wasn't one measurement that made a difference. It was a whole suite of things. And it's been uh, 20 years or more since then. And basically, as the measurements have improved, um, this, this surprising picture has gotten more and more robust, okay? It continues to hold up. And so there's clearly something right about it. Now, there are some interesting issues with the Hubble constant, as you mentioned. Recent measurements suggest there might be some disagreements there. We're still trying to sort that out. They're not very statistically significant uh, differences right now. Um, but there's something right about this picture. But the problem is that this, this basic concept of cosmology has three, what I call, deus ex machinae, you know, three things that are just thrown in that we have no understanding of at all. So we don't know what dark energy is. It doesn't relate to anything else we know about in physics. We don't know what dark matter is. It also is not consistent with any matter on Earth that we've ever seen. And our attempts to try to find it at accelerators and the dark matter detectors have come up empty so far. And three, the model requires something called inflation, which is another kind of dark energy field which occurs very early in the universe. And we don't know what that is either. So if you throw in these three ingredients, you can write down a set of equations which describes the universe very well, but it has these elements that we don't have any explanation for. So it's yes. an interesting situation to be in. A very well-measured yes. theory that has basic unexplained aspects to it. Yeah, yeah that's, that's really interesting. So, um, you know, in some sense, when things fit, you say, you know, if they, you get comfortable. Right. Uh, but if things sort of fit based on very limited observations, then, you know, one could argue we are sort of making things fit. And right. dark energy and dark matter is about 95 percent of the universe. Inflation, um, uh, I don't know, uh, perhaps a hypothesis that they sort of make things work. So we have made the standard model sort of work, but we don't really know. Um, because our observations are really limited, right, uh, to, to come up with these things. Well, they're limited in the sense that we have limited information about the earlier phases of the universe, but we have a bunch of different techniques to use to make these sorts of probes. Now, that's where Rubin comes in, because Rubin yeah. will dramatically improve that database. And so it does come down to um, making measurements with much higher precision. And there's, there are really interesting parallels with the history of physics in terms of other domains. So we've seen this before where we have a pretty good theory of how things work. And, you know, people say, okay, it's done. You know, you have the theory, why continue to study it? But nevertheless, we continue to make increasingly precise measurements. And eventually you find a crack. You know, something doesn't quite work as well as you thought it was. It would. And that crack is incredibly important because often it provides a clue to why the whole theory was close to being correct in the first place. And so we've seen that with quantum mechanics. So, you know, in the, at the end of the 19th century, we had a very good classical model of basically, you know, the forces that we'd seen, gravity and electromagnetism, et cetera. Um, there were a lot of unexplained elements to it, um, and they were known at the time, but, you know, people said, okay, fine, it works very well, until, you know, with more and more precise studies of matter and atoms and things, we found some things that didn't make sense. That led to the um, understanding of quantum mechanics, and eventually a whole new paradigm for, for building that model. And then the connection, what is the connection between quantum mechanics and classical physics became an interesting topic. So it may well be that our current theory of cosmology is that sort of classical analog. It kind of works and we get it, 
but there's some deeper underlying element to it that we don't yet understand. We don't have a framework to understand it, but if we find cracks in the system, if we find ways in which it doesn't quite work, that gives us more information to probe what's really going on. And so, so you know, sometimes people say um, that, you know, what good is it? You've got a theory that works pretty well. You're just trying to measure things more and more precisely. You know, if you don't find anything wrong with it, then you've kind of wasted your time. I don't view that. It's already, to me, incredibly surprising that this relatively simple mathematical description works as well as it does. And so continuing to probe it with experiments, with increasing power and, and statistical precision, to me, the worst that can happen is we'll find that it works even better than we already knew it works. And that yeah, would be really surprising see, see, and interesting too. Yeah, but wouldn't you say, I mean, uh, we can say it works, but then, you know, in any other field, suppose I say it works, but 95% of it is, I have no clue what the heck they are. Um, you know, most people will say, yeah, oh, sure. You know, I can make life sciences work with 95% of unknown things. Uh, and so I think there is a lot to be, so I'm going to sort of step through the, uh, going back to the Rubin Observatory, sort yeah. of step through the different objectives. So. Could we start closer to us? So, so what do you mean by taking an inventory of the solar system? Right. So, so the the most important element of objects of, in the solar system, with respect to, you know, looking at the sky, is the fact that they move. <laughs> we know about the planets because they move, and we know about comets and asteroids and things like that. So, studying the solar system. Is observationally is largely a question of studying things that move across the sky and how they move. And so with the Rubin Observatory, we will take essentially a thousand pictures of every part of half the sky, which includes most of the equatorial plane of the solar system. And so, so this is in Chile, right? So are we looking looking to the southern hemisphere yeah, or at the southern hemisphere? Yeah. And so pretty much we'll map the entire southern hemisphere of sky with a little bit of excursion into the north uh, for particular reason, particularly for the ecliptic. But in any case, so you have a thousand of these exposures. So you compare the images of the thousand images and, and things that are moving, you know, you'll see in one place at one time and another place at another time. And so they're not hard to recognize. And, and then from those measurements, you can actually determine the orbits. And the orbits, uh, and, and because this observatory goes to very faint levels, we'll see really small bodies in the solar system. You know, we'll see uh, fairly small asteroids, of course, comets, uh, and we'll also see um, debris in the solar system out to the outer edges of the solar system. So that's the sense we'll take an inventory. We'll find everything that moves in the sky. And those, those will all be solar system objects. And for all of them, we will have orbits. So the orbits are really interesting because you can, once you know the orbits, you can trace them forward in time and see how the universe will continue, the solar system will continue to evolve. But you can also trace them back in time and you can see where these things come from. And when you do the latter, it turns out that most of the small bodies in the solar system in one form or another were produced by fractionation, by larger things that banged into one another and broke up into smaller parts, and then those smaller parts go on on their own orbits. So when you can trace the orbits back in time, you can find these coalescences, and you can find the larger objects that were there originally that later then collided. And you can even get some information about the history of how these populations formed in the solar system. And that has a, a very important effect on understanding why the solar system got to the stage it's at today. And, and in particular, as we're finding more and more exoplanetary systems, um, you know, solar systems around other stars, then um, which look very different from our solar system, we get to understand a little bit about what the possibilities were there. So you could sort of simulate backward 
and see how things sort of evolved over time, right? So I, I remember, I, I just saw yesterday, Steve, uh, there was something between Mars and Jupiter that the article said is worth a quadrillion dollars because it's, uh, it's uh, mostly gold and platinum or something like that. And uh, what went through my head is uh, the price of something is determined by demand and supply. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, if you dump, uh, you know, 100 billion tons of gold, uh, gold's value will go to zero. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of interest in um, sort of uh, mining of objects um, out there. So, so this, with this mission, we will have sort of a detailed understanding of all the things that fly around with the solar system. Yeah, so some of that is partly just for the interest in the solar system. So, you know, taking this inventory and making this census. But one of the other main, main things that will come from this is we will detect the lion's share of asteroids that potentially could impact the Earth, that we call potentially hazardous asteroids. And because we know their orbits, we know how they're going to propagate, and, and we can figure out which ones could could actually interact with the Earth. Uh, and there's a particular size range, which is tricky. As, as you'd expect, the population of asteroids increases dramatically as you go to smaller size, and the, the larger ones are more rare. There's a what we call a power law distribution, you know, and the number of such objects is a function of their size. And so the very largest objects, which, you know, if they hit the Earth, could destroy the Earth, those are pretty rare, and in fact, we already know about most of them, and none of them are going to hit the Earth anytime soon. Uh, and then at the very small end, you have objects which, you know, are of order 10 kilometers in size or so, and there, they're very numerous. We don't know of most of them. They could impact the Earth, but most of them will uh, burn up in the atmosphere. So they, they could impact the, the Earth, but they won't really do a lot of damage. But there's a magic size range of around 100 kilometers where those objects are large enough to actually do damage on the Earth. The most likely damage they would do is create a tsunami by falling into the ocean. And, um, and yet, we don't know where most, we don't know of most of them. We, we haven't seen all of them. We don't know their orbits. And so that is the biggest threat region, is this kind of intermediate size range because they're quite numerous um, and they're not well cataloged. So that's where Rubin will, will dramatically help the situation. Um, with yeah. this, other kinds of comets and asteroids, it's more of you know, interest from solar system sense, but you brought up mining of asteroids. We'll, we'll have the largest catalog of such objects with their orbits, so NASA can use that to select objects that we might eventually want to visit. Uh, with you know, with an artificial uh, satellite and, uh, and and interact. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like we are safe to the next election, Steve. Um, <laughs> but uh, propose that. Uh, so that when you say intermediate size, so you said hundred kilometers. So hundred kilometer, sort of the the big axis of the yeah, object. That is. That is the, diameter. Think of it as the diameter of the object. So hundred kilometer object. If it hits the Earth, um, that we can tolerate that something of that size. Well, it depends where it hits, of course, right? If it hits Manhattan, <laughs> that would be. Pretty <laughs> <nice>. <laughs> um, the most of the Earth's surface, as you know, is ocean. So the most likely thing that will happen is such an object will fall in the ocean somewhere. And then that large an impact will almost certainly create worldwide tsunami. So the, the most likely, you know, danger to civilization is for coastal cities and that tsunami danger. Yeah. But we have sufficient amount of warning, I would imagine, right? I mean, if you're tracking these things, we would know. Well, so, yeah, so we have a lot of tools for following things. And, but the, the, the real issue is, finding them in the first place and knowing that they're even potential. So once an object is identified as having an orbit, orbit that could impact the Earth, then uh, there are radar systems we can use. We know where it is, we know where it's going, and so then we can track its trajectory extremely well. 
right? So you wouldn't use Rubin to follow the object all the way uh, toward the time of potential impact. Uh, but if you didn't know the thing was there in the first place, you can't focus your radar at it. So, so Rubin is a finder scope in that sense. It'll, it'll identify a catalog of objects that have the potential to be impactors, uh, and then other resources can be brought to bear uh, to study them in detail. And there are a number of near misses that happen, you know, all the time. And yeah, they don't they don't report it anymore. Huh? I feel it's sort of uh, a little unsettling uh, when I hear things like, you know, a big thing just flew past, uh, you know, between Earth and the moon. Right. And nobody reports that. Right. Right. It's pretty close. Right. I mean, right. Yeah, uh, yeah. So that seems to be happening. So, so the next stage, I guess, so the exploring the transient optical sky. So what does that mean? Right. So uh, because, you know, for most things we've studied with conventional telescopes, um, we've only looked at them over a limited period of time. We don't really know how things vary in the sky. Now, in other in other wavelength bands or energy bands in like X-rays or gamma rays, we've had missions that have all sky sensitivity. And so they've seen things that vary up and down. Those are relatively exotic objects. But in the optical band that our eyes can see, um, there's been no very systematic study of the varying of the variable sky in order to um, in order to develop a catalog. So obviously, and we are we know already that there are a lot of things that vary in the sky, many different kinds of variable stars that either pulsate uh, or there are binary star systems that revolve around each other and cause vari variations. There are all sorts of explosive phenomena in the universe, supernovae, classical novae, gamma ray bursts. So there's a lot of things we know, but if you look at, you know, the, what we know is largely governed by what we have the capability to measure. And every time we look in sort of new domains, we find new things we didn't know about at all. Yeah. So in, in this case, we're building a big telescope that is going to have time resolution everywhere from you know minutes to years. And so where, where there's the biggest hole in our knowledge is for faint objects that vary uh, very quickly in time that you know and the, and we don't know very much about what might be out there like that just because we've never really looked. So this time the, the it's what? Oh, sorry. Uh, quickly in time, meaning days. It can even be as little as milliseconds. Oh, okay. And and yeah. so as we've developed new capabilities, we find sort of startling new phenomena that we never know were there. And those are sometimes the most interesting things in astronomy. So in the past few years, for example, um, not our our team, but uh, uh, radio astronomers have discovered what are called fast radio bursts. Yeah. which are literally very significant brightenings of objects over milliseconds. And, um, and it turns out there are about a thousand of these things per day that go off. And we never knew about them, you know, 10, 20 years ago. When, you know, when there were a few discovered, and now they're starting to do surveys in the radio, and they're finding that these things are, are plentiful. We actually know that they're extragalactic, so they're from five, quite far distances, which means that they're extremely energetic events on very short periods. So very exciting phenomena uh, that we just didn't know about before. Now we yeah. don't, we still don't know whether they have optical counterparts. So Ru one of the things Ruben can possibly do is to see if if these things emit um, optical light. There could be other kinds of different phenomena that that give us, you know, short brightenings as well. Yeah. I know there's something up in Canada, Steve, that is sort of really specialized in FRBs. Yeah, that's uh, called- But that, that's not optical. They're that's looking at a different frequency. That's a radio survey facility. And radio. they're the ones, it's called CHIME, C-H-I-M-E. And they're the ones that have really not discovered FRBs, but, but really, determine that there's a large population of these and measured many of them. 
But there's yeah. a radio measurement. The um, Ruben will be looking at optical right. changes in FRB type sources. Right. So, you know, it could be FRBs, it could be various kinds of gamma ray bursts, exploding stars, or other kinds of energetic phenomena. There are plenty of ideas about what could be out there. But, um, you know, usually our ideas before we do the observations are not very good. And we find things that surprise us nevertheless. So this element of the science from Ruben, I think, is the most discovery based, you know, where where it's possible we'll find stuff we just never knew existed before. And so that's exciting for that purpose. Right. right. Uh, so the next step up is sort of mapping the Milky Way. Um, right. I think I thought we already have mapped the Milky Way. We haven't. Right. So. We have lots of images of the Milky Way, many different wavelength bands. But what we don't know very well, the thing that we know least in astronomy for measurement is distance. And that's because distance is hard. It's easy to tell where something is in the sky, you know, what, what its angular coordinates are. But how far away it is is tricky. That, refer, that requires a kind of modeling. Right. So for the most distant stars, you know, we think we know what the star is from its spectrum. We think we know how bright it ought to be. And then we measure how bright it is. And that can tell us how far away it is. But those distances are uncertain. Now, the, the technique that built up what we call the cosmic distance ladder that allows us to try to determine distances to objects uh, started with the nearest stars using what's called stellar parallax. So as the Earth makes its orbit around the sun, it's moving a distance around the solar system. And if you're looking at a star which is not that far away, on one side of the sun, you see it in one position. On the other side of the sun, you'll see it shifted in angular position because you're in a different position relative to it. Now, clearly, as the star gets further and further away, that gets harder and harder to do because the distance that we move around the sun is small compared to the distance to the star. So it's only a very small angular shift. And so we have parallax measurements on the most nearby stars. And so we know those distances very well. And as you get further away, you know, the, the parallax measurements get dicier and we start to lose that information. And so over most of the Milky Way, we don't really know the distances very well. Now, by a chain of inference, you can measure the distances to few things, to some things. Then you see others that look like them, and they're fainter, and so you can infer the distance. But there's a lot of inference there. Um, with Rubin, as I said, we'll have a 1,000 measurements of every part of the sky, every part of the southern sky. So stars, parallax measurements, if you go out to the edges of the galaxy, get to be at the level of a thousandth of an arc second. That's a very, very difficult distance to measure um, in, or angular shift to measure if you only make one observation. Yeah. But if you make observations over 10 years and a thousand of them, then you get enough data you can actually get down to that level of about a milli arc second or a thousandth of an arc second. And that allows us to measure distances out to a thousand parsecs or, or so, which is um, a very substantial distance in the galaxy. And so we'll be able to get absolute distances to many different objects uh, in the galaxy, which will give us a much better mapping of at least the nearer regions of the, of the galaxy than we've never been able to do before. And that's important for studies of stellar evolution and other things. But then there's one other element to this, which is in some sense even more exciting to me. And that is as you look out to the fainter levels in the galaxy, there are remnants of what we call tidal streams. So these are smaller galaxies or proto galaxies that were gravitationally attracted to the Milky Way and over cosmic time have fallen into the Milky Way. Now, as they fall in, just due to the tidal forces, the stars that made up that proto-galaxy get stripped away and they leave a trail. 
And these trails are hard to see because there are so many stars in the sky. So if you look at a random part of the sky, you just see a whole bunch of stars. A small fraction of those stars are in this trail, but you can't make them out. And the reason is because you can't tell the nearby ones from the more distant ones. So if we filter out all the near, nearer stars by measuring small angular shifts of them, the ones that are further away and are not, when you, when, you, when you take out all of the nearer objects, then you start to see these tidal streams. And the tidal streams are fascinating because they tell you the history of how the Milky Way formed. And also the stars in the trail form a kind of orbit of what that proto-galaxy was doing as it fell into the Milky Way. And that the shape of that orbit depends on the dark matter content of our galaxy. So we can also learn something about the dark matter in our galaxy from it. So that's, again, a large statistical investigation that's going to take, you know, a fair amount of observational time to do, but we'll get it for free with the Rubin Observatory. So that's also very exciting. I, I don't know if I understood this correctly, um, Steve. I saw uh, sort of a star being ejected from the Milky Way. It's like a metallic star moving at 1,000 kilometers per second or something. Right. Uh, just recently, so th these are these are things that are moving in enormous enormous speeds, right? When when something gets ejected from such a process. Yeah. So the way they get ejected is generally by close interaction, gravitational interactions with other stars. So if you have a relatively small star that whose orbit takes it close to a really massive star, it'll get sped up as it approaches that massive star and then and then flung away. And we actually use that to for orbits NASA uses that to get to to get our satellites further out into the solar system. Um, we you know we we send an object that does a close flyby around Jupiter or Saturn and then gets gets thrown further out or around the moon. So that's a, a well known effect and that happens from from stellar encounters just gravitationally, but if the star's orbit gets redirected outward, it'll just move out of the galaxy at a high, at a high velocity. Yeah, I was amazed by you know some of the images that Andrea gets uh, did around the, the black hole or the supposed black hole at the center of the galaxy. Things you know sort of um, going around it, but there seemed to be an orbit around the black hole. Wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't I mean if you if you're approaching a black hole, wouldn't it be you know, just just get ejected. No, if you're if you're further from a black hole, the black hole looks like a mass concentration, just like the sun. Yeah. What's unique about the black hole is that you can get physically much closer. So the mass is very compact. So you can get to relativistic velocities around the black hole and even get captured and fall into the black hole. But if you're a ways away from the standpoint of the gravitational force, the gravitational force of a black hole is the same as the gravitational force of a star would be that had the same mass. So what Andrea and others are seeing is our stars, which are pretty close to the center, so they're moving rapidly because the black hole is so compact. So from those measurements, you can determine how much mass had to be there to be making those stars move around in those fast orbits. And the amount of mass required in that volume of space is high enough that it really can't be anything other than a black hole. That, that's how that, that there is on that, yeah. And so, so that the larger objective of uh, Rubin is, you say, probing dark energy and dark matter. We talked a bit about that uh, already. Uh, so this proto-galaxy is falling into Milky Way, you said, might give us some sense of dark matter distribution in the galaxy. So, so yeah. what exactly are we measuring to get a better feel for this? So, so the, we believe that dark matter, dark matter dominates the matter in the universe. It's about a factor of five more than the conventional matter that we see. So in terms of gravitational interactions, dark matter is the dominant effect. So as the universe formed, structures grew by gravitational instability. So in other words, if there's slightly more mass in one area, it attracts other mass and you gradually form 
things which became stars and then galaxies and then clusters of galaxies as time went on. And our own Milky Way is believed to have formed that way. So the dark matter collects gravitationally and then the matter, come, the ordinary matter comes along with it. The ordinary matter is dissipated. It, you know, it interacts electromagnetically in other ways, so it releases energy and it eventually forms the stars that we see. But it is still true that most of the binding mass of the Milky Way is in dark matter. And actually the shape of that dark matter halo is difficult to ascertain because we can't see it, right? We can only detect its effect gravitationally. So these, these galaxies which infall, these tidal streams are sensitive to the gravitational field of the galaxy, not just the visible matter. And so they, they're sensitive to dark matter as well. And so if we get enough tidal streams and we can probe their orbits, we can start to map out what the dark matter halo distribution would look like. But on a larger scale, we can actually see dark matter. And the way we see it is by a phenomenon called gravitational lensing. So um, one of Einstein's predictions from general relativity is that mass concentrations not only attract other mass, they also bend light. And so light from distant stars that passes by concentrations of dark matter get bent. And that causes a distortion in the pattern. So it's the same as if you have a painting on your wall and you hold a wine glass up and you look through the wine glass at the painting you'll see the painting distorted, okay? As the wine glass acts like a lens. Now, the wine glass is transparent. So in some sense, you're not seeing the glass. You're not, you're not actually seeing the glass, it's transparent. What you're seeing is the distortion of the field behind the glass. And the same thing works for gravitational lensing. So as we look at distant galaxies, we can discern subtle distortions in the pattern due to concentrations of dark matter in the intervening path. And that's a phenomenon called gravitational lensing, and in particular called weak gravitational lensing is a small distortion that allows us to map out what is the dark matter content of the universe as we look toward the most distant galaxies in the universe. And the problem with this is it's a very subtle small effect, okay? The, the typical weak lensing distortion of background galaxies is something like a part in 10 to the five. That means if you, if you started with a perfectly circular galaxy, you would end up with something which is slightly elliptical at a part in 10 to the five. So that's very, very weak effect, which means if you look at any one galaxy, you didn't know what its intrinsic shape was to begin with, there's no way to know that that was lensed or not. So it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense in trying to do it object by object. But if you look at a whole field of galaxies and you see them distorted in the same way in a particular direction, then you know that there's a certain concentration of dark matter in the way. So it's the statistical measurement of, of the correlations in the distortions of galaxies. And that's what we're measuring. Now that takes um, an enormous number of galaxies, literally billions of galaxies, to measure it well enough to really say something quantitative about the structure of the universe. So what we're measuring there is how the dark matter concentrated as a function of time from the earliest times in the history of the universe till now. And if the universe were expanding steadily, then you would see that process occurring at a particular rate. If the universe were accelerating, then you'll see less, less clustering than you would expect just due to gravitational instability. And if the universe were decelerating, you'd see more. So if we measure that effect quantitatively very well, we can not only map out where the dark matter is in the universe, we can also determine how the universe is expanding, which is the measurement of dark energy. And that's a technique which 
around the late 1990s, early 2000s, people had the idea to do this, but we didn't have the data to make a measurement that was quantitatively meaningful. And now with Rubin, for the first time, we'll perfect this to such a level that it's likely to be the best method, measurement we have of the expansion of the universe, and will tell us about dark energy. Yeah, that's that's really exciting. So the, the trick here, uh, Steve, if I understand this, one is a large amount of data, large number of observations, billions of galaxies, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. and that is improving the accuracy of those measurements. Right. And so, so there's a whole, uh, I don't know, the quantity of data that you're going to, so is it, is it up and running now? So where we are, we're in the final stages of construction. And if it had not been, so everything that had to be fabricated is fabricated. And we're putting it all together. Um, and um, if it hadn't been for COVID, we would be complete. We were projected to be complete by about May of next year. And then we would sort of, you know, be in the middle of commissioning now and, and taking the initial data set. Um, in fact, we lost about a little over a year and a half due to COVID because we had to take people off the mountain and we couldn't let people travel to Chile and all sorts of things happened. So we're delayed. So we'll, we'll complete the project. We're projected to complete the project now um, at the near the beginning of 2024. So it's about a little over two years away. But, yes, but everything yes. is built and we have it and it's all there. It's just a question of getting back. To, we're still not entirely back to full effort because of COVID. So there's, there's still some issues there. And, uh, and then we have about a year and a half, two years of, of technical work just to do to re continue assembling things. So, so what's the expected lifespan of Rubin? So Lubin, Rubin is will operate for 10 years. For 10 years. And so 10 years of continuous observations every night of the year. And um, over that time, we'll get something like 5 million images. And each image is 10 square degrees, which is like 40 times the size of the full moon. So what, the, what made Rubin possible, there were several things that came together technologically that made this project possible at the time we started it in the early 2000s um, and none of that existed before so in, even though this idea is pretty pretty obvious important thing to do we didn't really have the capability to do it before the early 2000s so those three things are one you need a very large field of view uh, system you the, you don't want to be assembling your images of half the sky in little tiny pieces so you need an optical system that allows you to take big images that are still free of distortions. And that requires special kind of optics, but you also need a very large mirror in order to collect a lot of light to go to paint. And so we had to develop the technology to create an optical system with a large field of view and a very large collecting area. That was one challenge. The second thing is you have a large field of view, it doesn't help you unless you have a camera that's big enough to take that picture. So we, what we're building, and nearly complete, is, is the largest digital camera ever fabricated in the world for ground-based astronomy. And, uh, and it's literally the size of, uh, of an SUV. Um, and the focal plane itself is like 60 centimeters, so it's maybe that big across. Um, and uh, nobody's ever built a camera that big before. And there's a lot of technical details that have to be worked out when you scale up to that size. So that also took uh, very advan advancements in sensor technology, in electronics, in optics, the lenses for it, and various things. All that was breaking new ground. And then the other interesting thing is the data system. You mentioned it's a lot of data. Over its lifetime, uh, Rubin will produce a few hundred petabytes of data. And a petabyte is 10 to the 15 bytes. So that's like 10 to the 17 bytes. So that's you know far more than everything that's ever been written in all the languages of the world in human history. It's, it's an interesting number is it's a few percent of all the cell phone pictures that everybody has taken with their phones over, over the years since cell phones have been in existence. 
And um, so it's an enormous amount of data. And when we started the project, we thought we would need like the largest computer center in the world to process it and that it would be the biggest data set in the world. Now, of course, with the information technology explosion, we're no longer the biggest data set. We're, we're, we're up there, but we're not, we're not the largest by far. Um, but we had to invent a lot of technology to process the images quickly, uh, to produce these catalogs of stars and galaxies. And then what was one of the most interesting problems is not just assembling the database or the catalog, but how do you query that catalog? If you say, find me, you know, all the stars which have this particular colors and vary this way and do that, how do you search a database which has trillions of lines in it in a reasonable period of time? So that had to be uh, kind of invented too. So we've made, we've made uh, major technological advances on the telescope side, on the camera side and on the data side. All those have really advanced. Yeah. And the other technology that's advancing, as you know, is artificial intelligence. Right. And so I would imagine uh, because of the, the, the quantity of data, right. um, perhaps there are some you know, uh, mechanistic uh, analytics uh, of that information that might be going on as well. Right. So we've had the explosion in machine learning technology and artificial intelligence in the last few years. Uh, and there's already been a, an enormous number of applications to astronomy generally, and particularly to sky surveys like Rubin, um, where it's exactly as you say. We have an enormous amount of data. We're looking for patterns. We may, in some cases, we're looking for unknown unknowns, things we didn't know were there. And how, how do you digest that? What is the right way to do it? And it's already been demonstrated that machine learning offers a lot of really interesting possibilities to do things that humans simply wouldn't be capable of. Not only humans wouldn't be capable of, but the fast computers in the world wouldn't be capable of if we're trying to tell them how to do it. So the advantage of learning systems is that they find the patterns that are there without us giving a prescriptive recipe. And that's what's really new and um, likely to have enormous impact on Rubin science. So this is a, a really forefront area that um, I think once the data become available, um, it'll, it'll be mostly machine learning and artificial intelligence techniques that are used to analyze it because they appear to be so powerful for finding these kinds of things. And, and let me say that, I, you know, in some ways I think of Rubin as a kind of astronomical archaeological experiments. You know, number one, we're studying the history of things in the universe, on the universe as a whole, the solar system, the Milky Way, as I've described. But also, we're acquiring this fantastic database just because we can. So we will measure something like 40 billion stars and galaxies. It's the first time in human history we'll know of many more things in the universe than there are people on Earth. And so, you know, we, we, we should acquire those data just because we can acquire them. And then it may take a century for humans to figure out what's in that database. But, um, but we, we can get it. It's so if you discover like a new archaeological site, uh, the first thing you do is send a team of people in to get everything out of the ground. You don't have each person pick up a little shard of pottery and say, what is this? Let me figure out what this is. You just get it all out of the ground, you get a catalog, you get it archived, and then over many years, archaeologists study it and figure out what's happening. And that's kind of similar to what we're doing with Ruby. Yeah, so all I can say, Steve, is uh, make sure you have a second copy. You don't want to lose it. <laughs> Yes, we will definitely. <laughs> and so, so in conclusion, Steve, uh, so we talked about multiple sort of scale uh, of information coming in. Uh, you already mentioned one area that you're very excited about, that is the proto galaxies um, falling into the Milky Way that gives us some idea of the dark matter uh, distribution. Uh, so in conclusion, of, you know, if you look at the entire scope of the project, where do you think we will make sort of the, the, the most interesting, this is a difficult question to answer, but 
where would you think we'll make the most interesting observation or discovery or whatever you want to call it? Yeah, so, you know, of course, it depends what we measure. So I think, as I, as I was saying earlier, in the time domain region, you know, looking for things that just change the brightness, that's the really open area of discovery. So I expect that we will find many examples of things we just simply didn't know existed before, and that will be exciting. Um, in the area of cosmology, where I talk about dark matter, dark energy, there's the potential that we'll find, you know, some breakthrough, a crack in the model, as I was saying, that actually clears up, you know, many of these mysteries. So that would be truly profound. That would be, you know, kind of among the most important discoveries in physics, if that were real. Um, a lot of the rest of the stuff is fascinating and very interesting astronomy, and it addresses questions that have been around for a very long period of time. And how exciting it is depends a bit, again, on what we measure. But given the history of, a sci of astronomy as a science, it is one of the most empirically driven sciences. Despite the fact that modern astrophysics is a branch of physics, still most of what we know in astronomy and astrophysics is because we observed something and then figured out what it was, rather than we predicted something and then looked for it. And so it, it is a really exciting field to be in for that reason. And, and we can forget, you know, sort of the, maybe not the sexiest aspect of Rubin, but having that intermediate objects flying around in the solar system, having their uh, orbits defined uh, exhaustingly um, is, a, is a big thing too, right? Uh, yeah. We don't want to be hit, we don't want to be dinosaurs. Yeah, <laughs> oh, for sure. And uh, there's a really dedicated team of scientists, solar system scientists around the world that have been really excited about this. So we have collaborations in each of these different areas. The biggest is the dark energy collaboration, which has like a thousand people in it now. But um, the, you know, we have many collaborations for different areas of astronomy. And so there's a, a good fraction of the world's professional community will be engaged in this. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, this has been great, Steve. Thanks so much for spending time with me. Yeah, well, I appreciate it. It was fun to talk. Thank great. you. All right. See you. Bye.